I've been on a bit of a fixed income bender. It's 2 a.m. here. And I want to talk the most important things I believe in the Bitcoin treasury landscape. I want to talk about why fixed income products are valuable, what the unlock is, and specifically strife, strike, liquidation preferences, moving liquidation preferences, making amendments to these fixed income products, all the most important stuff, how these fixed income products will behave at the limit, what could happen to the MSTR common, what could happen to the price of strife, why is strife more valuable than the other instruments, does the senior claim over the assets matter, Do, will converts exist in the future, there's a million things I want to talk about, let's get into it, I think this would be super helpful for understanding these products because it really is the future, I believe, of MSTR and the future of all Bitcoin treasury companies. Equity won't always be on sale. Uh, at some point, people get fed up. Let's hop into it. Super excited. First, let's talk Josh's post. Josh is kind of the adult in the room when it comes to valuing bonds, so I defer to him and his kind of guidance. And what he points out is how to value a bond. We'll get into that later. And then talks about valuing a perpetuity, and Strife is, in fact, a perpetuity. And he lays out these scenarios where Strife goes to crazy numbers in a zero interest rate environment, simply because as the risk-free rate approaches zero and Strife's credit spread also approaches zero, you could see crazy principal appreciation because the value of a perpetuity is the coupon over the discount rate. The discount rate being the risk-free rate plus the risk premium associated with that instrument. And again, we'll talk about it later, but Strife is an instrument that only becomes more credit worthy with time and every asset, every equity sold, every equity in MSTR's capital structure works for Strife. All works for Strife's credit rating. It's all designed around Strife at this moment in time. And Preston made a fantastic response and he said, yes, but working off a Bitcoin framework, if you use the Bitcoin power law or use sailors models, there should be a terminal Bitcoin growth rate, that being 20% annually, which would define the discount rate of STRF. Okay, yes, but in the case of a liquidation scenario, we don't use Bitcoin, we use USD. So we're talking about these abstract scenarios where the risk-free rate is zero, we're dealing with a perpetuity with a moving liquidation preference, but that all matters because strife is a massive bet and people don't understand the full implications of strife. And I wanna explain why here. The implications of such a perpetuity are such that strategy can never wipe strife off its balance sheet. It is stuck with a senior $10 yielding perpetuity until the end of its duration. So until the company is insolvent. So what they're betting is that Bitcoin's terminal CAGR will always be greater until the end of time than the risk-free rate of the US dollar. They've designed this preferred equity to trade down to the risk-free rate as more capital is brought onto the, strategy, onto the strategy's balance sheet, which is the entire design of the equity. Again, to express the bet that strategies made is that the USD risk-free rate will forever until the end of time be less than the terminal CAGR of Bitcoin, CAGR being compound annual growth rate. Now, th these are the bond equations. With a perpetuity, you can just erase the face value because it's just the sum of all the coupon payments uh, over one plus the discount rate times the time periods. You can integrate that and you'll get the perpetuity, the perpetuity being the coupon over the discount rate. And again, the discount rate is the risk-free rate, which you, we can use here as the three-month T-bill yield, which right now is about 4.26%, plus the risk premium on top of it. Right now, the strategy is trading with about a 440 basis point risk premium. So it's trading like distressed, nonsense debt. I want to just illustrate here for the sake of argument, the point Preston makes is very interesting for a Bitcoiner because you'd say, oh, okay, if Bitcoin has a terminal, let's say just Bitcoin has a 20% CAGR until the end of time from here on forward, then the true value of Strife with Bitcoin as a risk-free rate is $50. It's below its liquidation preference. It's not valuable. However, in a zero interest rate environment or an environment in which interest rates fall or approximate zero or get close to zero, then the coupon payment, which is fixed at $10 per share for Strife, as the risk-free rate goes to zero and the, the risk uh, premium of Strife goes to zero, that present value of that coupon of that perpetuity goes to infinity. And so that's what I'm talking about here. Again, so this is the model of, of that sort of behavior. 
And I'm not saying interest rates will go to zero. I don't know. That's the, the model posed here. But what's really interesting is if Strife were to trade at the risk-free rate today, it would be about $243 per share, $234 per share. Let's talk about the liquidation preference because the liquidation preference, the liquidation preference is the present value of the future coupon payments. If coupon payments were being missed and the company were compounding this cumulative dividend, there are protections in place such as strife holders will be able to rectify the situation. Liquidation preference is what enforces such payout in the case the strategy becomes insolvent, the payout of the present value of this perpetuity. The liquidation preference has to be moving for strife to be an investment grade instrument. And it does. It moves off the greatest of these three of these three conditions, the floor being $100 per share, the last sale price via ATM into the market, or the arithmetic average of the last 10 reported trading days. That's the real clause. It essentially means Strife's liquidation preference is moving. As Strife trades up, the liquidation preference will trade up with it. That's the guarantee, the senior guarantee, senior unsecured guarantee in the case of liquidation to the Strife holders, which is extremely, extremely important. Uh, for the secure uh, senior equity. It also makes things tricky and very complicated in a serious liquidation event. So I've talked a lot with the other True North guys about what happens if strategy becomes insolvent. What happens if Bitcoin's falling and strategy trades at a discount and no one wants to buy the equity and there's predatory shorts and they can't cover the payments? Any of that. What happens? Well, the moving liquidation on Strife could be used as a predatory mechanism to reduce Bitcoin per, sh per share for the common equity holders. I'm not saying this will happen. Likely, Strife holders will sell because the credit rating of Strife will decrease as the price of Bitcoin decreases. But if someone wanted to be very, very predatory, they would own all of Strife and continue to bid Strife up, such that they had a senior claim on the assets of strategy. As they bid the price of Strife up in a falling Bitcoin environment, they could reduce the Bitcoin per share for the common equity holders while shorting the common equity. And this would be some sort of predatory, hostile, senior ownership over the Bitcoin. You could ultimately, st you could have a claim over strategies Bitcoin in this scenario. So that's really weird, especially in a low interest rate environment. It's very, very weird how all of this could work, but likely Bitcoin will continue to go up. So the bet you're making in the long run is that the Bitcoin Kager terminally is greater than that of the USD risk-free rate. Uh, in liquidation events, things get weird, and that's something everyone needs to think about. I want to talk more about the Strife Prospectus and the different amendments that could be made. So we saw recently that the STRK Prospectus was amended to implement a moving liquidation preference, where at first it was static. It's now moving, and it has the same provisions of the STRF liquidation preference, however junior to STRF. First and foremost, no vote by the STF shareholder, STRF shareholders is required. If there's no adverse effect to the SDRF shareholders, that's why with SDRK, they were able to change the liquidation preference because it only benefited the SDRK shareholders. That same clause is embedded in the SDRK prospectus. But what's really, really important to note is there are protections for senior instruments uh, above strife. So for there to be approved a equity instrument that is senior in either liquidation preference or dividend payments to SDRF, it requires the approval and vote of SDRF holders. So it guarantees no preferred equities will be issued above SDRF. However, obviously the converts are a senior equity in the capital structure that could continue to be issued. And as long as those are out there, Strife will not approach the risk-free rate. I take that back, maybe over a very long period of time. Likely the converts will convert and Strife will take its place as the crown jewel at the very top of the pyramid of strategy's capital stack. Those are the really important protections for STRF. The most important one being there can be no senior dividend or liquidation equities above STRF. <clears throat> These are the amendments made to the STRK prospectus, which completely changes the game for STRK. With the moving liquidation, as the price of strategy gets bid up, or in a bear market if things are going south, strike still has junior to STRF, but an over-collateralized claim on strategies Bitcoin in the case of liquidation, which is very, very reassuring to big institutional investors who are looking to get MSTR exposure, plus the bond floor and the liquidation preference working in tangent with that bond floor. So the liquidation preference, again, is very, very important to enforce the payments of the cumulative dividend, because if the cumulative dividend doesn't get paid over a long enough period of time, there are protections in place 
for the holders of these products such that those dividends must be paid or the liquidation preference must be paid out. And so again, that's why the liquidation preference moving and matching the securities is very, very important simply for the, secure, the preferred security holders. Could they be used in a predatory manner against the common shareholders? Yes, they could. And that's something people have to think about. This is a slide of the central bank's latest rate expectations. You can see the median or the base case falling to about 3.5 in the end of 26. Let's use that as where strife could technically go. And we'll look at some credit spreads in the next slide. Now, there's different ratings of investment grade securities and non-investment grade securities. Triple A, double A, single A, and triple B are the investment grade securities. You can look at the typical credit spreads. And the credit spread is just a fancy word for the coupon premium of the debt above the equivalent risk-free U.S. debt. And again, in the case of a perpetuity like Strife, we'll use the three-month T-bill of 4.25% as our base risk-free rate. And <clears throat> I've given some examples of AAA-rated corporations, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, uh, AA Plus and AA-rated Apple and Amazon, triple B-rated company, and double B-rated non-investment grade corporations as well. And I'm going to go into detail on both Macy's and Apple to see how do they stack up, what are the terms of their debt, what is the debt structure, and how does that compare to STRF? Will it ever be a AA rated security? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's ever going to get rated. I think we'll continue to trade up in the short term. We look at Macy's, they have about 38 million of quarterly free cash flow. They have about 16 billion of total assets on their balance sheet. And they have both secured and unsecured debt. And that's super important. It's something to really understand. Now, there's another Bitcoin treasury company, Naka, which does have secured debt. And this significantly reduces the credit worthiness of any preferred instrument they decide to issue. It's, it's pretty much like shooting yourself in the foot by having secured debt. It's complete suicide when it comes to trying to create a credit worthy Bitcoin uh, capital stack. So the two tranches of debt, again, is $2.1 billion, billion of the secured debt which is senior to the $2.78 billion worth of senior unsecured debt on Macy's balance sheet. And you can see that uh, relative to their different assets, most of their assets aren't that liquid. And once you subtract out the secured debt on the capital structure, which isn't totally fair because there are, uh, um, there are collateralization requirements on that debt, you have about a 4.3x coverage on the unsecured debt uh, relative to the rest of Macy's balance sheet. But what's interesting to look is the quality of these balance sheets. And so when you look at a fully liquid 24-7 um, mark-to-market security like Bitcoin, you can always kind of understand what the, the relative value is. However, in the case of a strategy liquidation event where they'd be forced to sell their Bitcoin, this would have massive implications for the actual creditworthiness of the securities like Strife and Strike. Because if if you were to go out and sell 600,000 Bitcoin into the open market to cover the holders of those senior equities, the price of Bitcoin would absolutely tank and it would be a complete disaster. And that's why Josh sometimes talks about the fate of the Bitcoin ecosystem in the case of a crazy cat catastrophic liquidation event will be in the STRF shareholders' hands, which is crazy to think about. Crazy to think about. Anyway, 4.3x over collateralization. What are Macy's assets? Well, they have property and equipment set at $4.9 billion, and uh, that's 43.4% of their <clears throat> unsecured assets. Again, they have $11 billion of unsecured assets. And property and equipment, so uh, women's shoes, women's dresses, right, if you use assets, other assets, cash and cash equivalents, nine, $932 million. So these aren't real assets, right? Like these aren't easily recoverable. The credit quality of these assets are a lot different than that of Bitcoin. And that's why we talk about Bitcoin as pristine collateral. But that's all good and well, very interesting. The unsecured nature of that debt, of this, the senior secured debt, really lowers the credit quality of the unsecured senior debt. Let's look at a case like Apple. Apple obviously has massive, massive cash flows, about 120 billion net income a year, uh, a year with roughly 100 billion, 112 billion being returned to shareholders in the form of share buybacks and dividends. So, and they have only senior unsecured debt in their corporate structure, much like strategy, for example. 
However, they only have about $93 billion worth of debt relative to $112 billion annually that's being returned to shareholders. This is absolutely nothing. It's 3.3x returned, 3.4x times over collateralized by the assets on their balance sheet. This is largely irrelevant because of their massive free cash flow. So that being said, this isn't a great comparison, but it's interesting to see what sort of provisions. It's interesting to see how clean Apple's balance sheet is. Again, really important that you have senior unsecured debt that's not junior to any sort of secured debt on the balance sheet, especially when all your credit quality comes from this these capital assets, especially a volatile capital asset like Bitcoin. Any secured debt on a Bitcoin-backed preferred instrument issuing security corporation is complete suicide. It's complete suicide. You cannot have secured debt. You cannot have secured debt. You cannot have secured debt. Finally, we talk about strategy. Uh, you got all these converts, $8 billion worth of converts. Strife, as it sits now, is has a BTC rating of 7x. I don't like using those kinds of metrics. I want to think about Strife's ATM gets exhausted. The converts convert. What happens next? Let's say at some point in the future, strategy has $90 billion worth of Bitcoin. Either Bitcoin goes up by 50% or they increase their Bitcoin. Strife sits senior in the capital structure at $3 billion worth of Strife. That's a 30x over collateralized debt instrument. That with every single acquisition of Bitcoin via junior equities in the capital structure, that being Strike, Stride, or Common, or whatever other securities they generate, it all benefits the creditworthiness of Strife. The thing I want to finish with is this idea that if any of those junior equities have value, then it only means Strife has significantly, significantly more value because of their over-collateralized nature, especially the common. An equity is a call option on the future assets of a corporation. So when you're buying the common, you're buying sort of a weird forward-looking expectation of the amount of Bitcoin per share or total Bitcoin on a fully diluted basis at some point in the future. So, so long as the common equity has value, especially a forward-looking value, it's very, very bullish for the creditworthiness of Strife, specifically because we're talking about Bitcoin here. And Bitcoin being pristine collateral, Bitcoin being a mark-to-mark -mark security, uh, really changes the transparency and creditworthiness of these instruments. That's all to say, Strife could trade up. Those are my thoughts on credit instruments and how they relate to strategy and other Bitcoin treasury fixed income issuers.